What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf, DJ Chark. We're going to be breaking down these three guys. I cannot tell you how excited I am to make this one. This was easily the most upvoted request when I asked you guys who I should be breaking down. And I 100% agree. I have all these guys ranked as targets. Uh, all within a few spots of each other, and they all go in the range that we love targeting wide receivers, and they're being taken 23, 24, and 22. I don't know why I didn't go in order, but it's 22, 23, and 24, uh, all in that like fifth round range. So uh, this is a decision that the majority of us are going to need to make, and so I'm very excited for this one. If you have any other requests for breakdowns, um, doesn't have to be the mid-range, can be early, can be late. Um, any decision you're coming to in a draft that you want to see a breakdown between different players, let me know in the comment section. If you see one that you like, hit that upvote so I see it. So let's start things off with the stat of the day. Yesterday's stat was over the second half last season, the top four quarterbacks in points per game were Lamar Jackson, Ryan Tannehill, Drew Brees, Winston, and who was fifth? And the answer was Ryan Fitzpatrick. Will Cozine got that one first correctly. Today's stat, which running back led the league in average time spent behind the line of scrimmage? Okay, let's begin the breakdown. And now what we'll be doing is I'm going to go over each player individually first, talk about their floor, their ceiling, any risk factors, um, their most likely outcome, and then we're going to circle back. We're going to compare all three players and go over how I would rank them. So we're going to start off with DK Metcalf. Metcalf had really just a fantastic rookie season, finishing with 58 receptions, 900 yards, and seven touchdowns. It was definitely up and down, though. Uh, while he had some nice blow-up games, he definitely had a handful of games with two or fewer receptions, which is really going to hurt your roster. Uh, his snap share definitely is worth pointing out. Um, it's not a huge difference, but he averaged 54 snaps per game over the first seven weeks and then went up to 61 from week eight on. Again, I know it's not a lot, but he was a full-time player from week eight on. He was playing in like the upper 90s of snaps sometimes, but it was every passing down. He was only coming off the field when it was a clear run play. So he, he is an every down player. Um, and you saw his production increase. So over that first seven weeks, uh, he's only having like 8.5 points per game. And then it went up to 11 points per game uh, down the stretch from week eight on. Again, not a huge increase, but it's nice knowing they trusted him a little bit more over that second half of the season. But overall, it, it was just a great rookie year for DK. Um, and we saw his upside, his weekly upside in that playoff game, seven receptions, 160 yards, and a touchdown on nine targets. And the surprising thing about him was his route running in year one. We figured that he was going to run mostly deep routes and just try and win with his size and speed. But that's not really what happened. While he did run goes and slants on the majority of his routes, he still ran plenty of other routes and he was successful on nearly all of them while posting an 85th percentile success rate versus man, 79th percentile success rate versus press. So he was great in year one, which is scary given his 99th percentile speed score, 97th percentile burst score, 91st percentile catch radius, and early breakout age. So he was an incredible prospect, and then he showed us in year one, he can run routes, he can score touchdowns, he is awesome. And so pairing a player like that with Russell Wilson is a little bit unfair. And remember, that was as a rookie. He's turning 23 in December. So I expect him to improve this season and for them to design even more plays for him because he came in a little bit limited in what he could do maybe. They're going to expand the playbook. They're going to design plays for him downfield, and that's frightening. One thing I want to talk about uh, is definitely the touchdowns. A lot of people are going to look at eight touchdowns on 58 receptions and see regression. Um, it is definitely high, but it is actually sustainable. 
So that kind of shows how high his potential touchdown ceiling is if he ever sees a season with a ton of targets, uh, which is insane. But 18% of his total targets came in the end zone. That ranked first by a mile. And it's incredible that they were just willing to, as a rookie, as soon as they got into the end zone, they were looking at him. And they were featuring him in that area. And there's no real reason to expect that to change this season. So he can replicate those sort of touchdown numbers, uh, especially if the targets do go up just because of that role in the red zone. One thing we need to mention is that there are only 79 vacated targets in Seattle. So while we can say, oh, he'll improve, we'll get more targets this year. Well, who are you taking those targets away from? Because Lockett isn't going anywhere. And as much as Seattle should throw the ball more, they just refuse to. So while his theoretical ceiling is insane, it is possible that he's held back by the situation because he is not just going to pass Tyler Lockett by like 50 targets, right? They're probably going to be very close to each other. And since they are not a team that likes to just air it out every play, that does cap his upside. And that's why you can see his over-under for receiving yards is only 850. And you got to think about it. It does make a little bit of sense. Now, I think he goes over that. I think it is a little bit low. But it's not like he's going to go out there and get you, you know, 1,200, 1,300 yards, 15 touchdowns this season. I guess maybe if Tyler Lockett gets injured. But assuming Lockett's healthy, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, and just because they don't have enough volume in the offense. So I think a reasonable projection for him is somewhere around 70 receptions, around 1,000 yards, and in that 8 to 10 touchdown range, just knowing that he could get unlucky and fall closer to 6, but he could get lucky and be closer to 12 or 13 touchdowns. But I think around 70 for 1,000 is probably where he's going to be. And that would make him a low-end wide receiver too on a per-game basis, and that makes his ADP as the wide receiver 22, extremely fair, especially when you consider he's obviously on an upward trajectory in his career, and he could absolutely have a breakout season and finish much higher than that. But I think his most likely outcome is a low end too, which means his ADP is perfect. Up next, we have DJ Chark. Now, Chark is an insanely good pick this season because I think people forget how good he was last year, maybe just because of how it ended. So he suffers the ankle injury in week 14, so then he misses week 15, and was pretty clearly limited in weeks 16 and 17. So he may have finished the season as the 16th wide receiver in points per game. When he was actually healthy in weeks 1 through 14, he was 8th in points per game. That's incredible, and he's not being drafted anywhere near that, and it shows he's got a top five ceiling, right? Because it's not like he had a ceiling season last year, so if he was eighth in points per game while healthy through week 14, he could finish as a top five wide receiver. And being on pace for a top eight receiver on a Jaguars team that ranked 26th in scoring is pretty good. Now, one thing we do need to go over is those touchdowns. I know it looks great having eight touchdowns on a team that ranked 28th in touchdowns per game, but he is facing regression here. First off, he only had 5.4 expected touchdowns given where his targets were on the field. So on average, he should have scored 2.6 fewer than he did. But the real regression might come from the total touchdowns for the offense, and this is the total passing touchdowns. 82.76% of the Jaguars' touchdowns last season came through the air. That ranked first among any team last year by a mile and was actually the highest rate we've seen since the Chargers in 2015. I mean, the Jaguars only ran for three touchdowns last year. That's going to go up this season, which is bad news for Chark. Obviously, right? If they run for a higher percentage, it means they're throwing for a lower percentage, and if he also sees a little bit of regression uh, himself, then he could finish closer to that like four through six touchdown range, and that would make it really tough for him to finish as a wide receiver one. But I want to remind you, that doesn't affect his ceiling. 
right? That maybe makes us think that maybe he was closer to his ceiling last season, but his ceiling is still top five, right? I just want to point out that he was closer to his ceiling last season because he got lucky with touchdowns. Looking at the risk, there honestly isn't that much. Um, same quarterback as most of last season. He's pretty clearly the top target. LaVisca Chenault is going to be a good wide receiver, but it would be pretty bold projecting him for more work than Chark. So Chark's target share is very secure. He does have slightly more injury risk than some other wide receivers. He, of course, had the ankle injury last season, also had a concussion in the preseason, missed a month as a rookie uh, with a quad injury. He's not Will Fuller, all right? He's not just a super high injury risk. I just want to point out that he's a little bit more risky in that area as other people. Um, but the biggest risk is really just the offense. You know, it's not a high volume offense. They're not going to score a lot of touchdowns. They're not going to have a ton of yards. And so maybe if they have a season like Chicago did last year, then it might be difficult for him to score touchdowns and to produce to pay off his ADP. Ultimately, I think he's an excellent pick. And his ADP this year is much lower than his production was last season. So even if he sees some regression in touchdowns, that's fine because he was the wide receiver eight when healthy last year and he's being taken on average as the wide receiver 23. So Chark will absolutely remain a target for me. Uh, as far as median outcome, the Jaguars actually have the second fewest vacated targets in the league at just 56, including only 6% of their air yards left over from last season. So adding LaVisca Chenault means that someone needs to take a cut in their target share, uh, but that'll most likely come from DD and from Conley. Chark's the clear alpha, so his target share is very secure. Um, just know that there isn't a whole lot of room for him to expand from last season, unless we're just assuming other guys get completely phased out, which I guess is possible, but the most likely scenario is that that doesn't happen, uh, and that means he's going to be closer to what he did last season. But again, he was great last season, so that's fine. Um, looking at different projections, the consensus seems to be that he's going to be around 80 receptions, around 1,100 yards, and in that, like, six to eight touchdown range. Uh, and that would make him also a low end wide receiver two in points per game uh, with a slightly better projection overall than DK, but so close that it's basically not worth even mentioning. So one more wide receiver to break down and then we'll see how these guys stack up against each other. Uh, last up is Terry McLaurin. McLaurin, uh, of course, was a rookie last season, finished with 58 receptions, 919 yards and seven touchdowns through only 14 weeks, catching balls from Keenum, Colt McCoy, and then ultimately Dwayne Haskins, who is going to be, uh, of course, the starter this season. Now, McLaurin did play better with Keenum, uh, but it's important to note that he didn't play all that many games with him, so it's not really a large enough sample to go off saying, oh, well, he played better with Keenum. Maybe he just has no rapport with Haskins. He didn't play that many games with Keenum, so I'd look more at just what did he do with Haskins. He played seven full games with Dwayne uh, weeks 9 through 16 to close the season, posting a season-long pace of 68 for about uh, 1,050 yards and 4.5 and touchdowns on about 6.7 targets per game. Uh, and he was more of a low-end wide receiver 3 with Haskins at quarterback, but that was ultimately due to the offense and the quarterback play. You know, when you look at um, him producing more like a low-end three, it was not because McLaurin isn't a good receiver, okay? It was because the offense was garbage. He was absolutely dominant against both man and press coverage. These are things we look at to explain is someone able to win on the outside? If you're really good against man coverage, against press coverage, well, that's what you're going to see as a number one receiver on the outside. And if you can win in those scenarios, that's how you become the number one on a team. Well, he posted one of the best success rates we've seen from a rookie in recent years. And the only route that he had a below average success rate on was one that he only runs 2% of the time. He had a phenomenal 
rookie season and would have truly broken out had it not been for the dreadful quarterback play. But looking ahead to this season, the quarterback play could definitely be the same because Haskins is still the quarterback. But a lot of people were extremely high on Haskins coming out of college, and I don't think it's fair to just call him a bust after 203 pass attempts. All McLaurin needs is for Haskins to be close to league average. I'm not even going to ask for league average quarterback play. Just be close to league average. And I think that's possible. And that would be really nice for McLaurin. One huge positive is the targets. After the Harmon injury, Washington now has the fourth most vacated targets in the league. They're missing 178 targets from last season, including a third of their air yards. And when you take a look at the depth chart, who do you think is filling in these targets? I mean, behind Mick Lauren, it is absolute garbage. I know they have Steven Sims Jr., who I like, but he's obviously not a massive threat to Mick Lauren, and he's certainly not going to see 178 targets, right? Behind him, you've got Antonio Gandy-Golden, who could be okay someday, but certainly is not going to make much of an impact this season. You've got Cody Lattimore, who might be on the commissioner's exempt list. You've got Trey Quinn, who runs routes like two yards downfield, and honestly probably just backs up Sims this season. So then you look at tight ends, you're like, oh, they must have a tight end who catches passes. Nope, they got Sprinkle, Logan Thomas, Richard Rodgers. You're like, all right, so what about the running backs? Their only pass catching back is Antonio Gibson, who is going to have an extremely small role this season, and especially to start the year. So McLaurin is going to dominate the targets in this offense. And so it's not shocking that Vegas has his over-under for receiving yards 200 more than Metcalf's up at 1,050. That's a pretty nice over-under. And if you look at industry projections, they have him very close to Chark. 75, 80 receptions, about 1,100 yards, 6 to 8 touchdowns. It's exactly the same as what Chark is seeing. So I can see why you guys requested this breakdown. Uh, all are honestly fantastic picks. All these guys have insane upside, and they're all projected for about the same production. So who do I rank higher? Um, I do feel that Metcalf should be ranked ahead of Chark. While Chark beats him in targets, Metcalf has a massive edge in the touchdown department, not only from a median outcome, but the ceiling. If we're looking at which one of these guys could finish with 15 touchdowns, it's Metcalf. And I do also think that Metcalf is a better wide receiver than Chark, and he obviously has a better quarterback throwing him the ball as well. Minshew is fine, but you know he's not Russell Wilson. Um, and I do think that if Minshew struggles a bit this season, which is certainly possible, we haven't seen all that much from him, and he didn't show that he was all that good, if he struggles, it's going to impact Chark. And while you could say the same about McLaurin, obviously Dwayne Haskins could struggle as well, McLaurin is definitely a better wide receiver than Chark is. I don't think that's something that's up for debate. If you look at advanced metrics, McLaurin is just a better wide receiver at this point. Uh, and if you look at the target shares, I mean, McLaurin has no competition whatsoever. You know, so aside from Sims, I guess, but he's not threatening his role as the lead guy. So given how many targets are left over from last season, as long as Haskins isn't absolutely garbage, then McLaurin should be able to reach about 1,200 yards. In my opinion, he should be in that range, 1,100 to 1,200 yards. And because of that, I think the ranking should be McLaurin, then Metcalf, then Chark. Uh, with the reminder that these are all players to target. And if you want to change up that ranking, you listen to my breakdowns and you're like, no, you know, I actually do think Metcalf, because of that ceiling, should go ahead of McLaurin and it should be Metcalf, McLaurin, Chark. Go for it. These guys are not that different. Again, I think it's McLaurin, then Metcalf, then Chark. But if you want to change it up, I think all of them are fantastic picks. So I'm not going to complain if you take any of them. So 
If you want to see me do any other breakdowns, let me know in the comment section down below. And if you want to see my updated rankings at all times, you can do that at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. That's the end of this one. Hope you all did enjoy. If you did, how about hitting the like button and how about subscribing to the channel if you knew? But thanks for watching.